I think what we'll do is we'll we'll move on to the third part of tonight's talk. And here we're second half, we're in the autumn of 2021. So we're still in the pandemic, which is requiring us very much to stay local, um, which is is not a problem for us. <laughs> um, and this is, it's actually a very early photo uh, of still the, the view from, from our house. And just going through this view, um, in the background, you've got hills at about up, up to about just over 800 meters. So that's actually the same height as we are here in Italy. Um, if you look on the right hand side, this photo was taken quite a long time ago because you can still see that large plantation uh, on the, the lower horizon there. And if you go to the left-hand side, it's a subject for a completely different talk, but you can see a, a huge area of uh, monoculture plantation, which is one of the dominant land uses in the region that I come from and causing a lot of controversy at a, a local level. But we're going to focus on this nearer landscape and the browns that you see is really the unimproved uh, pasture, uh, primarily sheep and cattle that actually live in this area. And as you come down into the valleys and around the farmsteadings, you see the improved pasture where um, nutrients have been put on quite often. Uh, the existing plant life is, is, uh, is they put herbicides down and pesticides down to, to take out the indigenous um, species that are there, then replant with different uh, grass species, which are more vibrant, grow quicker, and therefore feed the, you can increase the density of stocking. Uh, and it's quite an interesting one because you go further south down to the bottom of our valley, the whole landscape is, is green and indeed uh, England's green and pleasant land is very much looks like this but from a it will be interesting to see through this project how that uh, how good that at green and pleasant land is for for the biodiversity um, just to the left of the farmhouse you see an area of woodland now this is wood pasture where the livestock um, are allowed to graze within the woods. And this very much is like a, an ancient way of, of feeding your livestock. The, the trees are thinned and then the, the livestock fertilize and, and pick up the seeds, but conversely uh, are putting good back into the soil. And just out of shot to the right-hand side uh, is a native, um, sorry, uh, uh, an, an old native woodland. And these areas, along with peat, which is a, another big land use issue, formed the subject matter of my next project. And we were invited by um, a local gallery to revisit our zero footprint project, the original one that I spoke about earlier, 12 years on uh, from, from, from when we first started shooting on the site. And we didn't want to just do the same photography so and we were now looking at the landscape through different eyes and very much informed by the project that I've just completed in Italy I decided I wanted to look at the biodiversity um, that we were witnessing not only on our small holding but also comparing that to different land types in the surrounding area and we to do that, the first thing I did was I needed to enrich my understanding. And over many years, I st have started reading a lot more books in this field. I've just put up three here that are some of the most inspiring books. And if, uh, if anybody wants to, it hasn't got time to just jot them down now, just let me know and I'll, I'll put you in, uh, I'll, I'll email you the, the names of them. But all three of these. This is scientists, but writing beautifully 
uh, about the landscape. Um, Robin Wall Kimmerer is also a Native American. So not only is she an ecologist that's scientifically analyzing, she's also exploring the old wisdoms of the indigenous peoples and comparing the science to the indigenous. It's extraordinary. Um, Suzanne Simard, the, the inventor of the wood wide web, um, where she had to fight conventional thinking for decades before everybody agreed that actually trees communicate with each other. Um, and Peter Wallenden and the Hidden Life of Trees is just a cornucopia of, of facts and revelations about trees that you may wish to look at. And then I also went into the, the field, into these different land use areas and explored them from a research perspective to try and understand them better from a number of different, in a number of different ways. So I was doing traditional photography, um, canopy and bark photography. I was just sitting, going and sitting in those landscapes and, and trying to work out what it was saying to me. So writing down my feelings as I was sat there. I was using all my senses, touch and, and taste even, uh, smell to, to get a, an essence of the differences between these landscapes. I was scratching in the soil, collecting soil samples, and you'll see why in a second, and also doing uh, species counts. So the bark photography uh, that you see here, this was actually a, a, a scientist friend of mine who works at, at the Forest Authority, um, recommended this as a way of, of comparing different treescapes particularly, uh, whereby you take a 30 meter square and you just look at a piece of bark and see the, the, the different mosses and lichens and liverworts that might be growing on, on that. And we see here just very quickly on the left hand side, you've got an ancient woodland, native woodland versus on the right hand side, probably about 40 year old uh, woodland and the differences between the two. Truly fascinating and something that uh, I'm continuing to explore. I then started doing canopy shots. I've only just started this, but um, I've got friends and family that are taking uh, a shot of the canopy each month in a local woodland uh, uh, for 12 months to see not only change of season in a single location, but how that compares from Scotland to the south of England and between uh, a deciduous woodland versus a, a, a conifer. Uh, woodland. So it'll be fascinating to see how that project continues over time. I'm not going to go, this is the soil samples and this is chromatography. I'm not going to go into this. This was the subject of Morag's entire talk on Friday. And Jamie, maybe we could put in the chat somewhere or direct people to the recording of that if people are interested in looking at this. But, but basically what it is from the soil samples, you put the soil sample into solution, you activate um, lab paper with silver nitrate, and then you wick up the solution from the individual soil species. In this case, it can be a plant, it can be an animal, it can be the soil, and their individual characteristics are displayed uh, unique. It's like a fingerprint, and more actually just completing a workshop in how you scientifically read these, uh, uh, what I think are just beautiful artistic patterns. There is a meaning behind every spike and every band that you see on these images. Um, it's a fascinating area and, and I look forward to understanding more about it myself. And then the other thing I was doing was in a similar area of land on each of the landscape types. I was actually going out and I'm not a scientist, but just observing for a similar period of time, the number of species that I could identify in that particular land use type. And I'll come on to this in a bit more detail. So I went through all the different land uses that I was uh, looking at, and this is the scientific answer um, to my observation. So along the top row, you've got all the different uh, uh, land use types that I went into. And on the left-hand side, you've got the layers of vegetation. So starting with the canopy, so the trees, the number of species of trees you could see in any one of those land use types, 
down to the shrub layer, into the ground layer, and finally what's what I've termed here just as the layer, but this is the mosses, uh, the lichens and the liverworts. And you can see that some of the land use types have no canopy um, and no uh, shrub and even no ground layer. And this was a, a fascinating way of scientifically recording, but maybe not as engaging as, as uh, some other ways. And so that became my task for the exhibition was how do I present that information in a way that allows people to draw their own conclusions from it. And this was one of my work in progress. So you can see on the top right here, if I move the cursor, the species for that landscape. You then have my view with respect to the resilience of this landscape, with respect to not only carbon sequestration, but biodiversity, the local community, the people, and also the commercial, uh, is it making a return uh, to, that particular area of land. And then my words, my thoughts with respect to the, the landscape, both in a, it's not poetry, it's just in verse, a, a paragraph, but then just scribble words of how I feel felt when I was sat in that landscape. So this is a, an unthin 20 year old monoculture Sitka plantation. And what I was feeling was senses of, of crop and claustrophobia and, profiteering and, and uninspiring. These were just words that came out as I was sat there. So I was just writing them down, trying to present them here. Um, but for the exhibition, I decided that that was too messy. I need to do more work exploring how I can uh, explain some of the issues. So I actually did a, a, a pencil chart of some of the information that I collected that people could flick through. But the images themselves, I resorted to a, a mosaic. So the landscape that, it's, that I'm looking at is presented as a background. And then each of the individual species uh, was presented as a single square uh, on, uh, overlapped on top of that landscape. So the more squares and the smaller the squares, the more species and the greater the biodiversity of that landscape. So if we go to the open cast peat mine, it's not quite as local this one. I did have to, to travel uh, to this one uh, a little further than just being around the immediate, but it's a very significant land use issue around our area. So it was an, an, of interest and there was a planning application in for it um, for an extension to this peat mine. Now, now peat is, and, and peat bogs, are called the rainforests of Scotland. So when you see this one, you can see there's no squares on here at all. In fact, there was just one because in this open cast peat extraction, I could only find, and it was right at the edge on a bank, one species that was surviving. Uh, and yet when you get to the garden center and buy this stuff, everybody's growing their plants in it. So it was an extraordinary contrast with how we envisage compost and peat um, of what's actually happening in the ground. And indeed, by doing this, you're drying out the peat and releasing huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. But I, it also the way it was presented was allowing the individual to look at the different land use types and make their own minds up. So here, I just present for the purposes of, of tonight, the three or three of the different tree land uses. So on the left hand side is again that unthinned 20 year old monoculture plantation. The middle one is absolutely adjacent. It's the next door plot. It's a 40 year old plantation of, of Sitka spruce that's been thinned. You can see some of the trees have been felled and that's allowed more light in. And so that's had an impact. You can see the color difference between the two images. Uh, as the mosses have suddenly been given a, enough light um, to, to, to actually start uh, 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 growing. Uh, and there was an abundance, this amazing carpet of, of moss in this particular landscape. And then on the right hand side, again, immediately adjacent to the other two is a native uh, ancient remnant woodland unmanaged, completely unmanaged, 
Uh, and you can see much smaller mosaics on that particular one. And moving to the open ground, you have on the right hand side, there's the drained, um, the stones have been removed, the, 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 the indigenous grass stock has been taken out or, or killed, and then new seed stock has been put onto the field. Um, and you can see very big squares there. Smaller, the adjacent field to that, this is the semi-improved uh, with the sheep and cattle grazing it stock next door. And literally over the fence on the, the right-hand side is our active regeneration project. Um, so you're seeing the difference when, uh, and, and to be honest, I have to clear, just be clear that this is also, I've counted species in our garden because it fell within the same area plot. Uh, there is a quarry, there is a bog area, and there's a dry area. So it's a very diverse habitat. So it is actually uh, probably much, and a garden as well. So there's more species here than you would normally see in a, a rewilding. Um, indeed, we've planted a lot of different native tree species on the bottom half of the hill, whilst we've allowed the top half to naturally regenerate. So in the bottom half, we've got a wider mix of trees than you would normally get with natural regeneration. So where are the wild things? What is the conclusion to the project that I set out to ask the question I asked myself right at the beginning? Um, and this is the answer. So on the left hand side, uh, number one, um, the, the numbers that you see along the bottom of the total number of different plant species that I identified as I walked and observed. It's not accurate by any sense of the imagination, but all the, all the observations were done in a very short period of time over a period of two weeks. So it was a similar season. So there shouldn't be too much error in that, only in my quality of, of observing. Um, but what it did show suggest to me as I tried to interpret this, interestingly, was where we farm the land in an extractive way. So with the monoculture or the improved pasture or by the peat extraction, we see the lowest forms of, of biodiversity. As we move to low intensity farming, perhaps the more traditional farming measures, you see a significant increase in those numbers. When you unmanage, uh, you don't manage anything at all, a, a significant increase again. So three to four times what you see in a, a, the number of, of uh, plants than you see in a conifer plantation right next door. And then interestingly, where, and again, these are my observations, where man is working in association with nature on an active and, and the, the wood management, the wood pasture one at 99, that's where you're trying to recreate uh, man and nature with the, the big beasts and the smaller beasts snuffling around, but at lower densities and actually actively trying to regenerate uh, levels of forestry and different types of forestry uh, in that environment. This is a quite a unique one because from medieval times, this particular wood pasture has never been plowed, which makes a significant difference to the number of species you may see. And then on the right hand side is the, the garden itself. So just to finish up on, on this section, um, looking at the, the footprint, how we exhibited was also important to us. And you can see on the right hand side, this is Morag's chromatograms presented on the wall. All she did was very simply put them on recycled paper and stick them to the wall. So there was no framing, no glass at all, very low impact. Mine, I actually decided there had been a, I've got a thing called larch dieback. It's a disease that's impacting the, the larches in our area. And they've had to, fell anything that's got any signs of that disease, they've had to fell every single tree in the surrounding area to try and stop it spreading. So I actually asked a friend of mine who was a woodsmith if he could make these timbers out of one of those larches that had been felled. So 
my image is although they're framed there's no glass uh so it's very low impact very local uh and they were presented on the wall in that format in a in a series and just to finish um this is my favorite bit of the whole talk so i've saved it till last because this just for me blows me away of just how amazing nature is uh, when we give her a chance. So very kindly, Google um, Street View came and took photos along our road while we were building the house back in 2009. And that's what you see here. So above the house, you see the sheep pasture up to the horizon. You see no trees on the horizon whatsoever. You can see where we've planted. Um, this was actually the, the stakes uh, where we've planted a, a little coppice of, of birches, different subspecies of birches. It was actually a wedding present that we were given. Um, so there's a lot of different cultivars in there of the same species, which ups artificially ups the species count. Uh, and then you see the disturbance caused by our construction activities. Now, very nicely, 12 years later, Street View uh, came along again in June 2021, and reshot. And as we, we're now going to merge into the new view um, of our regeneration, rewilding project, um, where, and, and this is just fantastic. We've got, we've got a closed canopy. People always talk about, oh, I'm going to grow trees, but it's not going to be in my lifetime. Um, these trees are up to 25 feet tall now. We've got diameters of trunks that are up to 12 inches. Um, the closed canopy has formed on these birches, and we're now seeing a completely different habitat uh, underneath as the woodland starts and the light starts suppressing the brackens and the brambles that you see in the foreground. So this for me is is extraordinary even on the horizon with the 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 native um the natural regeneration you start seeing the trees coming in um so this is what it's all all about for us so just to close the talk um where next well again drawing from all the experiences that i've had i got a very small research grant from uh creative scotland to do some research, some more research with respect to treescapes, different treescapes around the UK. And I've started exploring them in a similar way that I have for the previous project. But what I want to do is, is what fascinates me is, is engagements with people to help raise awareness, to actively involve people in projects. And also hopefully to start working with scientists and academics because, I mean, I'll ask the question here, how many people have ever read a PhD paper uh, and got excited about it? Um, maybe one or two, about one or two PhD papers, whereas we all get visually stimulated in some shape or form by art that we see on the wall and when we engage with art in a number of different ways. So artists can actually help scientists and academics tell their story to normal people um, that aren't uh, scientists and academics. And so that's an area that I'm interested in. So what I want to do is look at ways of collecting data that I can collect data and others can collect data that makes it of value to others so they can do it in their own way. And what I've been doing is I've been going around the UK to locations I've identified where hopefully a significant amount of science has already been done. So we can compare my observations with the science that others have already collected. This is, this is down in Dartmoor in Devon, and this is apparently thought to be the only area of uh, ancient oak woodland that has never been managed in the UK, never seen any management as at all. This, we go up to Ardnamurchan on the west coast of Scotland. It's the same part of the same ancient oak forest that stretched from Scandinavia, Scan, Scandinavia? Scandinavia down to Portugal. Um, and I'm interested to see if there's similarities and differences across the ancient remnants of these woodlands. 
This is a local ancient remnant for woodland, but you can see by the, the, these trees that there's clearly been some, a, a greater level of management within this woodland, unless it was a very organized squirrel or jay that was planting its, uh, hiding its, hiding its nuts through the winter. Um, and I've been through a variety of other uh, wonderful, amazing um, treescapes. This one just off sky at Balmaclara is a, a birch woodland and just the clarity of the air causes the trees to drip with, literally drip with lichen. Uh, this was the, the, actually the whole project was a week long and it took place through the, the three big storms we had um, <laughs> last winter. So uh, some of the, so you get the, the movement of the significant winds coming into some of these images as well. And then finally, this was a, a larch, a local larch. This is just down the road, part of the, almost part of the zero footprint project. And then this woodland, this is the local conifer woodland. And I'm going to finish with him because I actually have become quite attached to this bit of woodland, spent a lot of time in the pandemic just sitting in this space. It's a 40 year old uh, woodland and I'm actually quite nervous about going home in about three weeks time because this is due to be felled and I, I've got a horrible feeling that somewhere I've become very attached to over many months of exploration in the last three years is just going to be a, a, a devastated uh, flat field again um, when I get back. So fingers crossed uh, that we get another year. And you can't finish any discussion about biodiversity without a, uh, a, a quote from uh, Sir David. So uh, salute to Sir David. And I'm going to leave you uh, with this quote. I utterly... Uh, uh, inspired by everything this gentleman has done. And this quote, I think, sums up my feelings as well. So thank you, everybody, very much for taking the time. I hope a few of you at least are still awake. Um, and if there are any questions, then I'd be delighted to hear them. Thank you, Ted. That was great. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. We have a few questions in the chat um, and please continue to pop them in. And I'm wondering if we're a small enough group. Ted, if you were to stop your screen share, you might see sure. everyone. And if anyone had questions for you, they could direct them to you directly. So let me just pick up one or two that were typed in earlier on in your talk. Um, a comment firstly, um, a lovely film. Uh, from Francis, lovely film, Ted. Um, Tracy is saying one doesn't typically think of sound when you say the word garden. So the images combined with the sounds really brought it to life. Mm. Was very moving. Uh, and Francis, uh, you did pose a question. Do you see differences between UK and Italian land management practices? And is there anything we could learn from them? I uh, utterly, utterly different. Um, but you have to recognise we're in very different landscapes in Italy compared to um, Scotland. So it's very steep sided hills uh, here in Italy. You have no field boundaries whatsoever um, in Italy at all. So whereas we've enclosed our landscape in the United Kingdom, uh, in Italy, you can, we do have a right to roam in Scotland, um, which is very different from, from England, but there, there just aren't any walls, there aren't any hedges as such where we live. And it's a very, you're talking about a community that was largely subsistent until the 80s, the 1980s, that is, uh, here in Liguria. So people are still very much in touch with the land. Everybody has their own small plot where they call it an auto, where they're growing, still growing their, uh, their own vegetables on a much larger scale than they are in the UK. But also the land management in, in Scotland, 450 people 
own over 50% of all the land in Scotland on massive, mostly sporting estates uh, and also for investment forests. Um, so the, the structure of the land is completely different. Whereas, you know, the local farmer here jokes that if you walk five meters, someone else will own the next plot of land and you'll never know who, who owns the land. So, um, and I think I'll probably just, just ending on that is because of this uh, 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 depopulation of the countryside, 66% of, of Liguria has tree cover. Um, whereas if you go to the UK, I think it's near 12%. Uh, U UK has, has got the fewest trees, despite the big massive plantations uh, anywhere in Europe. Um, and so that's a significant in difference between the UK and anywhere else in, in Europe with respect to uh, their way they think about land. Um, but what I would say is that I might have a very different view if I'd undertaken this project on the Piemonte Plain and the Milan Plain, which is the breadbasket of Italy. And so you've got a much, and post-war, um, the Americans came in offering the, what I call industrial agricultural solutions um, to uh, feeding the people. And so you have very different uh, techniques that are being uh, used in, in Piemont, on the Piemonte Plain compared to here. Thank you, Ted. Francis, you also had a comment about your ash dieback. Do you want to pose that yourself to Ted? Yeah, happy to, Ted. Um, you mentioned larch dieback and, and the trees that have been taken out so that it didn't spread. Um, I've got quite a large ash tree in the garden and it's been suffering from ash, ash dieback now for, I would say, a good two or three years anyway. Um, and we've had the, the tree officer in who had a look at it and said, yeah, it's in quite a bad way. I would be happy if you took it down. Um, however, what worries me is it supports so much other life. You know, it might be dying back and the leaves are gone and it's got fungus growing in it and everything, but it is alive with life. And there's part of me says, if it's not going to kill anybody immediately by falling down, should I not just leave it? It's not going to look body, let's be mm -hmm. honest. But, you know, should I maybe just leave it and just let it, be home to the beasties that live there? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult question for me to answer because I'm not a tree expert. Mm. Um, but my understanding is the reason that they are, they're looking to stop the spread is their, their reasoning for, for felling um, the, the larch uh, in our area. We, we live in a forest park, so it's, it's, you know, 50, 60 miles uh, circumference um, across the park. And, and it's a commercial forestry, essentially. And mm -hmm. if they can take out some of the, the affected trees, it might help save the other trees. Currently, it doesn't seem to be, have been effective in stopping the, the advance of the disease. Um, so, yeah, from your perspective, I can't answer that. I think the thing that concerns me more than anything is there's a, a, a huge dash currently towards just planting Sitka, monoculture Sitka uh, in our local area. They've seen what's happened to ash, to elm, to, to, to larch, and a lot of the natural carbon sequestration that our government has is, is to, to deliver its um, carbon targets um, are with respect to these trees. Um, and what concerns me is it would only need one pest or disease to arrive in Scotland to literally, say it's in 20 years time. We know these, they, they already exist in Europe, these beetles. Um, if the, the climate warms sufficiently that they can make their way to Scotland, you would be 
instantly destroying because they're focused on one species solution to a potential disastrous position with respect to meeting our climate targets. So I think that's my greatest concern with respect to pest and disease, whereas a, a, a biodiverse forest is, is much more uh, resilient to pest and disease. And indeed, they send messages to each other. If you read the Susan Simard book, the trees send messages to each other saying, I'm being attacked. And so the other trees throw out hormones to, uh, and toxins that make themselves unattractive to the pest or the disease that's attacking them. And so that, that they can help each other as a community to, to fend them off. I think one of the, the clearest ones, apparently giraffes, when they start munching a tree on the African savanna, they let off a very um, significant toxin. And if the wind's blowing in a certain direction, if they don't go upwind, they have to go about 300 meters before they can find the next tree that they mm -hmm. can start eating. So uh, uh, it's just fascinating as you start researching these things, your interest becomes higher and everything becomes more exciting. Sorry, that was a very long winded <laughs> answer. I went off in tangents all over the place. Oh, that's fascinating. And Morag has actually popped uh, into the chat something uh, uh, devanashdieback.org, uh, Francis, there might be something in there to, to read about. Thank you. Um, and maybe just the time to mention the Queen's Green Canopy, which was a Jubilee uh, initiative to, to plant trees across uh, the United Kingdom. And that has been extended to the spring. I think it was due to come to an end in October, but they've extended it into the spring. So. I guess if we could each think about where we might contribute to that green canopy, that might be um, that might be something to, to to do in memoriam. Any more questions for Ted on any elements of his talk this evening? Feel free to unmute yourself and pose your questions directly. Lots of lovely messages, Ted, thanking you in the chat. Um, and uh, I'm getting some direct messages as well. So one here, which was uh, excellent presentation, very thought provoking and knowledgeable. My dream too is to relocate to a home and location I love so much that makes me not want to travel too far beyond. Thank you very much. And that was from Heather. Um, I've got of... a quick question. Yes, really, please. How you can use, how somebody other than Ted and Mora can use their photography to sort of help with the environment or? Yeah, I think we, well, we can all do it in, in very different ways. I think the, the first thing that I would probably encourage is that you find a subject matter that inspires you. Um, because if you're not shooting images that you're interested by, then it's never going to be a photograph that comes from the soul. And if the photograph doesn't really express who you are, then I think you'll, that is, is ultimately visible in the image itself. So if you can find a subject matter that really excites you with respect to the environment, I think, first of all, the images will be stronger uh, as a result. And then it's a matter of can you with a local camera club or any local organizations look at ways that you can engage with others to raise through your photography and using your photography to give talks like this, to just talk with friends, to engage with others, to perhaps set up a little group that's exploring a theme. Um, and that way, you're not just doing it. We're, we're, we usually work as, as individuals and are quite solitary beasts, photographers, outdoor photographers particularly. But it can be very um, uh, uh, rewarding to work with, with others and maybe do a collaboration with other photographers in your area and try and get a group show together um, where you can then also give a talk about what you've done and and engage people in 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 the 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 discussion of whatever the subject matter is. 
others might have, if anybody else has got uh, their own thoughts on this, uh, feel free to jump into the discussion here. This is not something I'm any more qualified to, to tell than anybody else, but that's just my thoughts. I'm wondering if they're building on that, if something came out of this workshop that we attended today where we were talking about grassroots engagement in issues which are very localised. Um, and that's perhaps where people feel more connected if it's something they can directly relate to, like a local forest or a local community garden or a local huge planning application, whatever it might be that's going to impact their local environment. Um, and that's, there's ways to connect, including, you know, setting up little social media groups to share images and spark conversations. And I've certainly witnessed that local um, photo groups are very popular. People tend to follow them and contribute to them really quite freely. So there's something about, uh, I suppose, excuse the pun, but the kind of grassroots nature of it, Ted, mm -hmm. um, to engage people around issues that are important to them and their communities. I think grassroots is a, a huge part of raising awareness and, and it's engaging with the, the small voices that you don't usually get a chance to, to work with. Another thing that Morag actually does is she's in a, a, an ongoing collaboration with someone in Canada. They've never met. Um, <laughs> they've never traveled to each other's uh, location, but they share their work and, and bounce ideas off each other. They've, they've created a friendship, a remote friendship, and they bounce ideas off each other that they can then each share with their, their own friends and communities. So there's different, lots of different ways, I think, with, with social media, uh, et cetera, that we can work and develop our practices in different ways and and i do think maybe the time feels very different now from say five years ago when we did uh, the zero footprints.org project and i think perhaps i could set myself a, a, a an aspiration in 2023 to look at ways that we could reinvigorate that uh, taking on board grassroots and engaging people more proactively because um, I think people are more interested in this as a subject area than they were even five years ago. The zero footprints concept is so transferable. I mean, as an individual, I could pick up my camera and do a zero footprints from my own window. Um, you can, and that's, that's a lovely theme around which a community might gather to, to can, explore. You can do it in so many different ways. You can do it from your kitchen table. It doesn't have to be an outdoor mm -hmm. location. The location can be, it can be local to you. It can be a walk away. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to, you know, as long as you can get there easily is, is one of the things, but you could do indoors and, and do a variety of still lifes on your kitchen table based around that theme. Any number of, uh, uh, ways that you can approach the subject matter um, yeah and then and and then we need to look at how we share that information and someone has commented they're just showing up as iphone here and we have two iphones so i'm not quite sure which one it is um commenting that you made such a great point with the value of art in getting attention um versus scholastic papers um and of course, photography is one art form, but um, I think there's the power of coming together and collaborating with other art forms, the spoken word and the written word. And Francis, um, who's spoken already as a poet and has done collaborative works with other artists locally in our community. And I think there is something powerful about bringing together different art forms that different people might respond to in different ways. Uh, Francis, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on power of the spoken word, yeah, I mean, that's my kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, I find I, I, I write poems about trees and stories about trees all the time. And it doesn't matter what I'm writing, there is sure to be a tree will appear <laughs> as if by magic. But, yeah, I mean, I think the collaboration is, is fabulous. I mean, photographing trees you know, and writing about them. Um, there's an artist I saw an exhibition of Oh, it must be must be about three or four years ago now, and I can't for the life of me remember her name. Um, and she had actually taken 
huge canvases into the forest and painted the trees in situ um, in the forest. And it was the most amazing exhibition um, that I've seen in a very, very long time. So, you know, getting, getting in there and getting close and whatever, whatever your thing is, be it photography or, you know, art or poetry or whatever, um, I think actually just being there is such a huge part of it and listening and watching and, yeah. I, th I, I absolutely agree. And it goes back to that um, Nan Shepherd quote, the first slide of, of it's spending time in a location. So much of the time mm -hmm. we, we travel to a location, stay there a few hours and then move to the next location. But you don't understand that location if you just go and visit it for just a couple of hours. Um, it's only on repeat visits and that you start to understand and get under the skin of any given location. Um, but I'm fascinated by your collaborations and different art forms collaborating. I'm currently with the, the Treescapes project I'm working on um, producing. I'm, I'm doing a little workshop that's helping to guide me in how I bring that to some form of uh, uh, output. And we're looking at exactly this is not just having the images in a in a book or some form of ebook or whatever it is, but also having scientific quotes and poetry and the written word, as you saw on the the the, the slide clip um, that yeah. I produced here and producing them all together. So you're getting different views from different angles. And so, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's not just with other photographers you can collaborate. You're on mute, Jamie. I've just found a Turnaround Dance's um, piece on your dance trail that you did together with uh, the Turnaround Dance. Um, I'm just going to copy that into the chat. This was a piece of work that Francis did uh, around the University of Stirling. Um, I'm not sure if that's your full poetry that's there, Francis, or whether it's excerpts from your poems, but you wrote a number of poems in partnership with Grace Turner. Um, and I, is that right? You wrote, was it seven poems? Oh, you're now on mute, Francis. Yes, it was. It was seven. Yeah. And one yeah. was hornbeam and one was laurel and one was forest. Um, so I've shared that. It's in the chat for anyone who would like to, to look at, to read that afterwards. That was a, that was a beautiful piece of work. Yeah, the hornbeam was particularly exciting because it was the most beautiful tree. We both loved it. We visited the site independently and uh, Grace had fallen in love with the hornbeam, as had I. And we, when we got together a few weeks later, this was during lockdown, we said, the hornbeam, and she said, yes. And uh, yeah, we loved it. That's just a little snap of the page, but that's in the chat for anyone who would like to read those little poems later. Well, Ted, I think it just remains for me to thank you very much. There's lots of lovely thank yous in the chat, which we'll, uh, you'll pick up when we close down tonight. Thank you everyone for coming along and for being such a wonderful audience, uh, for sharing your thoughts and your ideas and your responses to Ted's talk tonight. I'm very hopeful that the University of Stirling's Festival of Biodiversity will go ahead in the spring. And what I will do is just post on our social media um, that that is happening and when that is happening. And very ho hopeful that uh, both Ted and Morag will participate in that when that happens. Um, one final comment on festival shout out. This is in fact the last event of Stories 2022 festival programme. So thank you very much to Ted for taking us out on a high. Um, we have one last element to our festival, which is our public call out for submissions to our exhibition. Um, each year we produce an exhibition um, of work submitted by the general public, professionals, amateurs alike photographs taken in any format and we do an exhibition and produce a commemorative photo book so um, just drop into chat uh, where you can find more details on that 
um, it's free to enter um, and books are produced for your, uh, for you to purchase if you wish. We're planning this year to take our exhibition on tour digitally. So rather than producing lots of pieces of work in um, traditional format, we're taking out into our community to share it um, in community centres, pubs and clubs across Stirlingshire. Um, so please have a look at that. And if you wish, do submit. We'd be delighted to have your entries for that. So finally, thank you all again, but it's particularly a huge thank you to Ted. So much to think about in that. Some amazing work done over the last decade or so. And I'm sure that will continue forward and you'll continue to inspire us, Ted. So thank you very much indeed. Well, and thank you all for listening. And please feel free to get in touch. Um, anybody, if you've got any queries or want to discuss any of the topics that have been raised, more than happy anytime. And thank you, Janie, as ever. You're welcome. Thank you. We'll say good night to you all, folks. Thank you for signing in. Ted and I'll just hang back to do a quick wash up, but we'll say good night to, to everybody. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm.